Hi, and welcome to this mind map. We're going to be running through populations and sustainability, which is module 6.6 .6 from the OCR A-level biology syllabus. And if you're watching this in 2022, this is on the advanced information. I didn't think I was going to uh, be able to get this done before your exam, but quite a few of you have been requesting it, so I've managed to make some time. So in this video, we're going to be looking at the following things. We're going to be looking at factors that uh, affect population size, different types of pop, uh, strategies, R and K strategies. We're going to be looking, about, looking at interactions between populations. We're going to be looking at sort of what conservation means, the difference between conservation and preservation, and how we can manage things sustainably. Um, we're going to look at interactions between populations, did I say that, such as predator-prey cycles. Uh, and then we're going to look at a range of case studies, okay, uh, and trying to kind of pull out the key uh, principles um, um, about conservation from those case studies, okay? Uh, so, I'm going to try and keep it brief. Uh, let's get started with population size. Oh, uh, and in this mind map, you won't need anything really but a big A3 piece of paper uh, and lots of colorful pens. So, let's get going. Okay, so when we're thinking about population sizes, it's helpful to think about a population arriving in a new area. So let's say that this is the population size over time of a species that lands in a sort of new area. And that species will go through three phases of its sort of population um, sort of growth. It'll go through sort of phase A over here, uh, B and C. Uh, and these phases are characterized by different things. So A is going to be the lag phase. And in lag phase, um, reproduction is slow. And in this lag phase, um, reproduction is slow. It might be that organisms are getting acclimatized uh, to an environment. So let's just write acclimatization. And that means kind of getting used to. Um, and if we're thinking about sort of larger animals, um, sort of wandering around a large new habitat they just reached, uh, it may be that they're just sort of struggling to find uh, reproductive partners, they're struggling to find mates, so it's just taking a while for reproduction to occur. <clears throat> after a while, after the animals get acclimatized, we're going to enter into B, and this is log phase. So B, log phase. We've got fast reproduction. Okay, and the key thing here in log phase is that the um, reproductive rate is much bigger than the death rate. So we're, we're growing exponentially because, you know, resources are plentiful, everything's good, population growing, growing, growing really rapidly. Finally, when we get to C, we're reaching stationary phase. Now you may recognize these terms, lag, log, and stationary phase from um, our sort of discussions on micro microbes and the way they grow, uh, so they're the same terms. So in stationary phase, some factor is slowing the growth of population. Okay, so we, we call these factors limiting factors. Oh, and I should put also that in stationary phase, um, reproduction is equal to death the rates of reproduction is equal to death because of the action of a limiting factor. So there, there can be lots of different uh, factors that affect a population that can be limiting in different scenarios. And we can group those factors into either, um, well, we can group them in a couple of ways. Um, not really on this unit, but worth worth reminding ourselves. We can group them into um, biotic factors, which mean factors to do with living living organisms or abiotic factors. I think it's worth just putting that on the mind map. It's uh, worth remembering. So uh, abiotic, non-living. So things like temperature would be an abiotic factor, and biotic factors might be Predators, for example. But more, um, perhaps more importantly for this unit, we should think about these factors in terms of whether they are density dependent or density independent. So let's uh, branch off this. Um, let's go down here. Uh, okay, so some of these factors are density 
dependent. And some of these factors are density independent. Now, what does that mean? OK, so density independent factors are factors that will have an effect on the population, no matter the same effect on the population, no matter the size of the population. So, for example, temperature, um, if it's suddenly, if there was suddenly like a, a cold, cold snap and the UK was plunged to minus 20 degrees Celsius because of some sort of Siberian air, then that cold temperature might reduce the population of animals in the UK. Uh, and it would reduce the population of certain animals because they're just not really, really adaptive for that temperature, no matter how many of them there were. OK, so temperature and things like to do with things to do with climate are often, often density independent. So the definition for density independent is same effect, no matter the size of the population. You could write that down. Same effect, no matter the size of the population. Um, but density dependent has more of an effect when the population is bigger. Um, perhaps it is worth noting that down. I'll put this in red here. So density independent uh, is same, same effect, no matter size. And density dependent is more effect uh, with bigger population. So also you can think of it like this factor is almost caused by the population. So there's lots of different factors that could be density dependent. So these could be things like uh, like food, like if there's more animals, there's less food for each animal. So food is a density dependent factor. Water, especially if we're thinking about things like plants, okay? Maybe not animals, because animals, like if there's a lake and they're like drinking from the lake, they're not going to like drink the whole lake. But if we're talking about the water availability in the soil, then that could be a density dependent factor for plants. Light might also be density dependent because plants grow and catch the light. So if you have a rainforest, lots of trees grow up, block the light, which means there's little light below. So that would be a density dependent factor for plants. We have light, we have shelter. Um, we could even have oxygen. Um, so this is, so it's, people often ask like, oh, is this density dependent or is this density independent? And you can't always answer that question straight away without knowing the scenario. So oxygen for me, sitting in my study here is not a density dependent factor for people because, well, not really, even as low, even as 7 billion people in the world, we're not going to deplete the world of its oxygen really. However, if you're talking about microbes growing in a little beaker, then if they grow rapidly, they can consume the oxygen in that beaker. So it depends on the scenario you're looking at, whether something is density independent or dependent. You have to think about the actual example. Um, oxygen, sort of, you know, space, space for, for living or for nesting um, and that sort of thing. OK, so if we're thinking about, um, I don't know, seabirds nesting on a cliff, there's only certain a number of little ledges where they can sit and have their X. So that might be a density dependent factor. OK, so all these density dependent factors, um, the, these are really the ones that cause stationary phase. So I'm just going to kind of like just do a little arrow like that. OK, it's kind of a sort of funny arrow. So it's the density dependent factors factors that when they when the population gets large they they build up in effect they have a large effect and they cause us to reach stationary phase now stationary phase um, the population plateaus and reaches something called a carrying capacity and that carrying capacity is set or determined by the action of those density dependent factors now the population may not exactly just hit the carrying capacity and like stay there exactly. It may go up and down a little bit due to like slight fluctuations in weather and stuff like that. But basically it's going to it's going to be around about that carrying capacity. Now all of this what we've talked about so far um, really only applies to one type of um, strategist. 
Um, let me just kind of do, do something here. Let's go to, so from population size, we've kind of talked about factors. And we're also going to talk about strategists, strategies. Okay, so there are really two main types of strategy um, in growing a population. Okay, there are those types of organisms that kind of follow this growth pattern, and they are called K strategists. K strategists. Now, K strategist is K for carrying capacity. I know K and C are not the same letter, but think of K for carrying. Um, K for K strategists reach the carrying capacity, uh, and K strategists typically have a few um, common features. They tend to be well. The most important thing is they have a slower reproduction rate. Um, and they tend to have slower um, development, um, long lifespan, later, re later reproduction, uh, later reproduction, long lifespan, and they tend to be large, okay, larger in size. So when I think of case strategists, I think of things like an elephant. Or I think of things like an orangutan, okay? Those are key strategists. So like orangutans, um, when a baby orangutan is born, it spends 11 years with its uh, with its mum, kind of learning the ropes, uh, learning the jungle and learning what to eat. Uh, and then it doesn't become sexually mature for a few years after that, but a few years after it leave, leaves its mother. So um, for an orangutan population to grow takes a great amount of time. Uh, likewise, elephants, uh, slow re slowly reproducing uh, animals and large animals. Um, large body mass. Whereas the other type of strategist is something called an R strategist. Okay, so this graph down here shows uh, an R strategist. And R for this one is R for reproduction. So R strategists are the opposite, they're much smaller. Okay, so R strategists have a much faster reproduction rate. The main thing that distinguishes K from R strategists is the reproduction rate. So, slower, no, sorry, faster, my bad, faster reproduction. And they tend to be um, quick developing. Quick developing organisms that have a short lifespan, basically all the opposites of these things. Quick developing, short lifespan, um, reaching sexual maturity quickly, small body mass, um, that sort of thing. So most microorganisms would fit in, fit into this category. In fact, pretty much all microorganisms. Things like microorganisms, um, insects weeds and mice okay one which i like to remember uh is is sort of something like a, something like a mouse okay so let's put some examples actually to the sides of these i'll just put them up here um e.g orang orangutan did you know that orangutan in indonesia means old man of the forest by the way um orangutan elephant uh and down here are strategists things like mice insects. If you fancy a little break, Google, well, go onto YouTube and put in uh, Australian mice plague, okay? So that shows you what happens to an R strategist. In fact, let's put that in. It's been a constant, it hasn't let up. The ground just moves with mice. There's just no escaping them. So this is a great example of an R strategist. Let's see this one what happened. This one probably the worst mouse plague I've ever been through. I've been through three others over the years. Hay in the hay shed where it's probably fifty, sixty thousand dollars ruined. Um, grain stored in big, big plastic bags. They've eaten them and ruined them. Everywhere they can go, they'll go. A lot of households have lost fridges and microwaves and all that where they've got in and chewed wiring and burnt them out. Oh, Mickey, Mickey. 
Same with cars, tractors, anything where they can get in, they'll get in and chew. We've come out of a drought and because things have suddenly got so good so quickly, you know, rapid breeders like mice are really able to capitalise no on that situation. I don't think. And it's going to take a while for the rest of the ecosystem to catch up and balance it out. The real economic damage is in the paddock. In Australia, most areas will only get one crop a year. And so to have a play hit you in what would otherwise be a good year, it can be a real setback. We're back to where we were in the middle of the drought and lost a lot of money and, and heartache in between. I'll leave it there. If you want to watch more of that, then find, uh, find this video on YouTube. Okay, so the important things from there, we saw, uh, we saw a couple of things. Um, we saw that this, you know, this plague suddenly kind of crops up, and we call this the boom. So I'm just going to label this graph here. So we've got the boom. Uh, and in this boom, the population is actually going to go beyond the carrying capacity. So this dotted line here is still the carrying capacity. But we could say it's kind of like the long-term carrying capacity. So the, the population boom of mice really explodes because of a quick change in like environmental conditions. So it's something like a density independent factor, like the temperature or the climate has changed, producing more rainfall and then more food. Now, because the R strategies can reproduce so quickly, their population kind of goes above the carrying capacity, um, but it can't be sustained there. So it is gonna lead to a bust eventually. These mice aren't gonna be running around uh, the Australian countryside forever. They are gonna run out of food. And that's one of the things why they're so annoying for farmers was because they like eat all the food and then they kind of then they're trying to look for food and they go into people's houses and, and just cause kind of mayhem so um the main thing is that the r strategies can reproduce so quickly that the density dependent factor doesn't have real time to impact them to cause them to level out to the carrying capacity they reproduce beyond the carrying capacity before the density dependent factor has an effect and brings them back down again okay uh i can't remember the exact a uh, number of mice that can be born, but it was, was it like 250 mice from one mouse in a season or something? So that's, it's very quick reproduction rate. Okay, moving on. Okay, so let's now talk about interactions between uh, different populations. So um, let's look first at proto-prey cycles. So this is a predator-prey interaction. So this science was kind of discovered in the late 1800s by fur trappers, okay? So you may, in an exam, be asked to analyze data like actual data. So here's just a little screenshot of this actual data uh, from the 1850s. So basically in the late 1800s, I think it was in Canada, the, um, there was a big business of trapping for fur. So people used to go out and try and catch animals to kind of get their furs to sell in like coats and jackets and hats and whatever. So two of the animals that they were looking for were the snowshoe hare, which was like very white fur, um, and the Canadian lynx, which kind of had like a, you know, fancy looking mottled camouflage type fur. Okay. So the hare is the prey and the lynx was the predator. And what they found was that the numbers that they could catch every year varied a huge amount, right? They didn't like catch the same every year. Uh, so they kind of were confused by this and they started to like take, uh, take sort of good records. And they found actually that the numbers would go up and down repeatedly, fluctuating up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And it was from this data that we started to think about the relationship between predators and prey and how they could get into a cycle like this. So this type of cycle is more common when we have a prey, sorry, a predator that kind of feeds almost exclusively on one prey. You know, when the predator is only eating the one prey and they're very closely linked. If we have a predator that has abundant different sources of food, then we don't get this cycle as much. Okay, so in this case, the lynx predominantly 
eats the, the hairs, and the hairs predominantly, mainly, get eaten by the lynx, and that's it, okay? So what happens? Well, let's look at this curve here. So um, the prey population, let's say it starts out pretty high, okay? The prey population is high. Uh, now, the first thing to notice actually here is that the prey is up here, and the predator population is always going to be lower. The predator population is always going to be lower because if we're thinking about pyramids of biomass and, and, and sort of the flow of energy, you have fewer predators than you do prey because there's um, energy lost at each step of a food chain. So we have to have more prey animals than, the, than predator animals, especially in terms of biomass. Okay, so with that caveat aside, the, the prey population here is high. And that means that if we look below, kind of just straight down below, what's happening to the predator population? Well, when the pr prey population is high, let's just write high here, the predator population is increasing. So I'll just do a little plus for increasing. The predator's population is in increasing because there is lots of food. And I'll write that on, lots of food. Well, what happens? As the predator population increases due to the lots of food, now, uh, I'll change color, the, the, um, the, the predator population is high at this point. And because of that, the prey population is now decreasing because there's um, lots of predation, okay? Lots of lynx eating the hare. Well, what does that mean? Well, because there's lots of predation, the prey population falls. So now we have a low prey population up here. And that means that uh, then we have a, a decreasing, put minus there, uh, predator population. Okay, you can kind of see where this is going. So because of the decreasing <coughs> predator population, uh, or sorry, the low, yeah, the decreasing predator population, let me just write here, uh, little food, little food available. Uh, that brings the predator population down until the predator population is again low. And now the predator population is, so to keep my color scale, so now we've got a low predator population. Uh, and that means there is basically um, plenty of food available and we I could write here little uh, predations. Sorry, it's getting a bit messy, but you can see what I'm trying to do little predation, so this is going up, and then we get high population, and we go round and round and round, okay? We go round and round in this cycle. So this kind of, this is the um, theoretical kind of curve for a predator-prey cycle, okay? Just taking a look back at that data again, uh, in real, real life data, we never get smooth data like this. It's always like a bit up and down, fluctuating, because it's not only um, these factors in isolation that affect the population. If we just remember all the factors that do affect population, you know, things like temperature and climate and rainfall and snowfall and all that sort of stuff will have impacts on the population of, of lynx and hare. So the data looks a bit more sort of spiky. This is kind of the theory of what it would be if, it, if there were no other factors affecting it. Okay, so that is a predator-prey cycle. And that is something that I think could come up um, this year. Okay, so that's one interaction between um, populations. Uh, and other interactions uh, are to do with competition. Let's just put some examples actually here. So e.g. hare plus lynx. Okay, hare is basically like a rabbit and lynx is a cat. Okay, e.g. hare and lynx. And then let's just actually make a note of the actual original stuff. Canada, 1800s to sort of 1900s, there's like 1850 to 1950 or something around that. Um, Canada, um, fur trappers, okay? And there is a question on this in the um, kind of mock paper that I just released last week. Um, but basically when, when you're looking at this data, obviously the data that the fur trappers collected is not collected in a scientific systematic manner. So even though the fur trapping data is accurate, it does represent the number of furs that were caught. We wouldn't really say that it is data that is valid data ready to make um, 
kind of hypotheses or make conclusions from because we don't read because there's no control really in how the data is collected and we would do more systematic methods for such as catch and release uh, or sorry uh, sorry catch mark and then recapture methods for estimating population size as opposed to this kind of this method <clears throat> right so now let's move on to talk about other interactions uh, so let's go down here uh, we're going to talk about competition here. Now, first of all, there's um, two different types of competition. There's intraspecific and interspecific. So let's uh, let's go to green. Intraspecific and interspecific. What do these mean? Okay, so in biology, intra means within. That's actually Latin, I think, intra. It means within. So intraspecific is within one species. So for example, if we have this, these are paramecium's, by the way. They're little tiny unicellular organisms. Paramecium. Here's a video of some paramecium swimming about. They're pretty cool. They've got little cilia, they swim, they kind of spiral, and they eat stuff like yeast and other, other microbes. Pretty awesome. Uh, so they are they're a protist. So a unicellular protist. And some of the classic experiments about competition were done on paramecium because we can have a population of paramecium's in a dish and look at it. Uh, it's quickly quick to grow, easy to study, easy to look at the population size. And it's a lot easier to look at paramecium populations than it is to look at populations of wolves, which might take you 50 years, like to chart the rises and falls. And we can kind of come up with theories and test them with something like a paramecium as opposed to larger animals. So that's why we talk about paramecium so much. So a paramecium is a unicellular protist. Now, intraspecific competition within one species might give rise to the standard population growth curve that we've seen. You know, it goes up and then it kind of reaches uh, a carrying capacity because over here, you know, at the top, there is competition for resources, which limits the ability of the paramecium to reproduce. There's competition for food, for example. Okay, so intraspecific competition is just competition uh, within one species and if, and if the population goes a bit too high then there's more competition if the, uh, if the population goes above the carrying capacity k then there's more competition and it may the population may decrease and if the uh, and if the population goes a bit below the carrying capacity there's less competition which means that more there's more resources and the population may increase so that's intraspecific competition which i think is generally um, a bit more easy to understand but what about interspecific competition so you need to know about two experiments that people did um, with, with yeast, basically, okay? So they took these two different types of yeast. Do I said yeast? I meant paramecium. Okay, they took the two different types of paramecium. Let's just call them a paramecium A and paramecium B. They're different types of species, but they're both paramecium, but they, they do different things. Okay, so first of all, they took A and they grew on its own, and A went like this. Boom, okay? Uh, reaching its carrying capacity. Okay, so that's A. Yay. And then they did another experiment, and then they took B. Okay, same scales. I'm not drawing the scales on, but let's just say same scales. And they took another one, uh, B. Let's do a different color. Purple for B. And it went, uh, it went a bit slower, and it got to there. Okay, so that's its carrying capacity. Boom. Okay. So on, on their own. So only A and only B. The same nutrients and the same beakers, I suppose, like exact replicas over the same time frame. Okay. So what they ended was they put A and B together um, at the same time. In the same beaker. Okay, so. I think I've got enough space here. I might have gone off my mind map. 
but you can kind of figure it out. Now, what happened was a bit weird because initially what happened was B actually kind of grew faster than it normally normally would. So it grew quite quickly, but then it started to decline, sort of peak and decline, and actually it went down to zero. Whereas the population of A was a little bit slower to get going, but then actually um, went faster and kind of started to grow and started, and I'm not sure if they actually reached its carrying capacity, but it, but it grew, okay? So this shows the fact that basically A outcompeted B. So A and B. So we call this um, competitive exclusion principle. Okay, this is some good terminology to use. Um, how much space have I got here? Yeah, I have gone below my mind map. Hopefully you've managed to fit this in on your page somewhere. So this is called the competitive exclusion principle. Okay, and this basically says that, this basically says that if you've got two organisms with same niche, then only one will basically survive. So a niche is basically, well niche, like if you're talking about like a niche, like in a, a house or like a bookshelf, you might put something into a little niche, like, oh, that's the perfect spot for that book. I'm just gonna put it into that niche. So in ecology, a niche is like a way that an organism fits in to a habitat or an ecosystem. So there's only one space for that niche. So you can't have, for example, okay, um, in, here's an interesting example, okay, so um, woodpeckers, okay, so woodpeckers peck and they hammer a little hole in a tree and they get a little insect out. Um, they get the insects out from the bark of the tree. So insects that kind of burrow in the bark of trees. In Europe, woodpeckers um, fulfill the niche of the, the predator that eats them. So we've got woodpeckers in, woodpeckers in Europe. Now in an island called Madagascar, there are no woodpeckers. So in Madagascar, we have a different organism that fulfills that niche which is actually called an eye eye. You can, uh, it looks like, like this, it has a super really long finger and it kind of digs and pries out that woodpeck, sorry, the insect from that niche. So I suppose what would happen is, if we introduced woodpeckers to Madagascar, nobody do that please, then it would really endanger the eye eye, okay? And the eye eyes would probably maybe even go extinct within, you know, 100, 200 years or something because it's the same niche, and the woodpecker might be able to outcompete the IIs in that niche. So, competitive exclusion principle says two organisms with the same niche, then only one survives. Now, um, I've often people often ask me, students often ask me, well, what on earth is going on with B? Why does B grow faster with A? And the answer, I'm not really sure. I can't seem to find it anywhere in any textbook, so I can only suggest or theorize possible scenarios. Maybe um, um, A, potentially, Paramecium A might be bigger than Paramecium B once it's fully grown. But maybe Paramecium B can actually eat Paramecium A when, the, when Paramecium A is, has just divided or something. So maybe at the, at the beginning of the interaction, kind of B has the upper hand and kind of eats A, but then once A gets to a certain size, um, then, then A eats B. Maybe, okay, so it's, a, it's an interesting one. I don't quite know why, but this is what they found. This is the data. So this is an example of interspecific competition. So I forgot to actually define what that means. Interspecific means between or among two species, okay? So maybe at school uh, or whatever, you might have like inter-house football or something. So that means football competitions between the different houses. So inter-specific means between the different species. So remember these two different species of paramecium, they are different species, they're very similar, but A and B, and they compete, and it turns out that A kind of wins, okay? So um, this is under controlled sort of 
um, setting, lab conditions, and again, remember that if this was done in, in the wild, if we, we wouldn't do it because it would be unethical, but if we were to release woodpeckers in Madagascar and see what happens to the eye eyes, there'd be fluctuations, wouldn't there, because there'd be other factors like um, habitat destruction and human impacts and, and climate uh, and all sorts of other factors that would make the population curves a bit more spiky, a bit more noisy, okay? So that just about sums up interactions between populations. So let's move on and now talk about um, conservation and preservation, the reasons uh, and the strategies. Okay, so now we're gonna look at sort of conservation and preservation. Now, there's quite a lot of overlap here between this unit, which is populations and sustainability, and the year 12 unit, which is biodiversity. So for a fuller explanation of kind of the reasons for biodiversity, reasons to protect biodiversity and, and threats, I recommend you watch that um, biodiversity video. So I'll just quickly show you what it looks like, if I can find it. So over here, if you watch the video um, on my channel, from about 36 minutes in, I kind of talk about all this stuff up here uh, and a little bit about the difference between conservation and preservation. I'll briefly recap it now, but do look at that video if you want to go uh, further. So first of all, why, why is it needed? Uh, well, there are threats. There's a lot of threats to biodiversity, okay? So let's go up here. It would be great if we didn't need to actively do conservation. So conservation is about doing something actively to maintain biodiversity. And it would be great if we didn't have to do this, but we do because there's lots of threats to biodiversity. Um, here are the top three uh, listed in this module. We've got um, over-exploitation. Um, and this could be of, uh, this could be of forests, for example, e.g. Uh, clear, oops, clear cutting forests, you know, completely and then not replanting them, um, or overfishing, overfishing, for example. Um, what else have we got? Other threats. We've got uh, habitat disruption and we've got species introduction. habitat disruption or destruction. Uh, and we've also got introduced species, I'll put that up here. And these top, uh, these sort of three top threats will come up time and time again in the case studies down here. Um, so how, do, how in each case study, how are any of these threats kind of um, around and what, what are we doing to kind of pro, sort of prevent them, basically? Uh, so those are the threats. The other reason, you know, why conserve is, you know, well, why should we, I guess, why should we care? Well, we should care because cons uh, the ecosystem provides us a lot of things. Uh, it may, so what does ecosystem provides? Uh, it provides, let's do a different color. So it provides food and materials. It provides ecosystem services. Uh, I go into a lot more detail on that in the other video from about 36 minutes in. So have a look at that, ecosystem services. <clears throat> Uh, it provides beneficial organisms. And these beneficial organisms might be natural, uh, sort of natural pest control. Or act as a genetic, uh, or a gene bank for genetics that we might want in our on our crops. So for example, um, in Peru, which is somewhere I visited, they have like an enormous number of different types of potato. Like I don't even know how many, let's say like 50 different types of potato or a hundred different types of potato. Because this is where potatoes came from. We took them from South America and we grew them around the world. Now let's say a new disease comes up that is affecting uh, the UK favorite potato. I don't know what it is. 
Oh, or in the Irish potato famine, there was a massive disease that wiped out all the potatoes in Ireland, caused famine, caused millions of, well, thousands of deaths because um, the country was very reliant on one specific type of potato. Um, then to kind of produce a potato that was resistant to this potato blight, um, then they had to go back to kind of the source and find a type of potato that was resistant to it. So having gene banks of um, wild types of potato like in Peru or in any other wild ecosystem might be very helpful if we need to increase the diversity of any crop plant that we're growing. Okay, so that's kind of the why, a little bit of the why and some of the threats. Um, but what about conservation strategies? Okay, now, now let's go over to, to this idea uh, of strategies. Right, now this is where we're gonna get into this idea of a, of a scale. So at one end we have preservation. And then we move down into, I'm gonna do that again. Apparently I can't draw a straight line. Um, we move down into conservation. And then I would suppose we, we'd move into sustainable management. So I'm gonna link that in there. And then if we go, well, if we go into sort of beyond on the scale, this is, we can go, we go into exploitation. And we, we don't wanna go into this exploitation. We don't wanna go into this zone, okay? So exploitation, let's first define uh, exploitation, okay? So exploitation down here is unsustainable use. use of, of resources. So this is by the action of using a resource, it means that there'll be less available in the future. So, you know, the, I kind of talked about some examples of this, but like overfishing. And EG, there's a case study of this, uh, was the Grand Banks. So overfishing, so e.g. a case study of this was the Grand Banks in Canada. Uh, and I forget the exact years, but the Grand Banks in Canada used to be packed with cod, like loads of cod. Uh, and it was the biggest cod fishery in the world. And they, people used, fished it for 50 years, 100 years. But the problem was that the fishing got better and better. People got better at fishing, better at extracting all the cod that they could from the sea. And at some point, it became unsustainable. That meant that um, the, the cod were being harvested, uh, let's write this down, harvested faster than they could breed. So scientists who were monitoring the population, and it was done not very well, um, sort of realized this, but they realized it a little bit too late. And by the time they realized that the population was going down, um, the government tried to act, but they had a lot of resistance from fishermen because fishermen, you know, they had jobs, they had families to feed and they wanted to keep doing what they'd always been doing. And they said, no, 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 you can't put rules and regulations on our fishing. We've always done it this way. Uh, the government did eventually pass some legislation, but it was delayed and it was too late. Um, so act today, there are basically zero cod, okay, off the Grand Banks in Canada. They are Canada. They are almost locally extinct and there is no and there's not enough cod to harvest, um, so they're completely extinct. Um, they've gone, let's say that it's, they're locally extinct. Now, to go a bit more further into that, because it's kind of interesting, like, why don't they, why don't they recover? Um, why doesn't, like, a cod swim over from the UK and start breeding and recover? It may be that the ecosystem has changed such that maybe other organisms or other fish have kind of now fulfilled the niche that cod were in. Um, and maybe the other, other types of fish will now 
prey on any baby cod that are there, which prevents the cod from re regrowing. And I'm pretty sure that cod fishing hasn't been done in in Canada for like at least, I don't know, 30 years or something, and, and it just hasn't come back. So this is exploitation, this is terrible, and this is what we don't want. So overfishing was an example. Uh, and, de and I'll just put deforestation as another example. You know, deforestation to, to cut timber is, is another example. Uh, I keep talking about Madagascar. I've been there. It's a great place to visit. Uh, I love it. But it has a lot of ecological problems. In, um, in Madagascar, for example, I can't remember what percentage of the, of the country has been deforested, but it's something like 70%. Had a huge population increase. I think the population has tripled, you know, tripled, I think, in the last 50 years. Uh, there's been a lot of cutting down of the forests for firewood and it hasn't really been replanted. So this is obviously unsustainable and causing great, great harm to all the different species that are there. OK, so that's one end of the of the sort of scale. Let's go up to the top end of the scale and then we'll kind of fill in the bits in between. So preservation, uh, just looking at my book here for the definition, is maintenance of habitats and ecosystems in their present conditions, minimizing human impact. So essentially, it is like fencing something off and don't go there, okay? Basically, pretty much having no human impact on that zone. I missed an N there, fencing. Fencing something off, don't go there. So uh, no humans allowed, no human, no human, uh, no human action at all. Okay, letting nature take its course, just stepping back and leaving it be. Okay, so that's preservation. And it does work really well in certain areas. Um, but sometimes um, an area needs a bit more conservation. So con conservation is uh, maintenance of biodiversity. and may include human action. Maintenance of biodiversity with, let's call it, maintenance of biodiversity with controlled human activity. Let's call it that. Okay, so it may be the case that uh, human actions can actually increase the biodiversity of a, of a place. Um, so let's look at um, some strategies of that. <clears throat> so, um, so controlled human activity, let's do that, and beneficial. So beneficial activities, what have we got? So we could, for example, provide extra food. Uh, yes, let's do, let's do green. So, for example, uh, I don't know, like, there's an orangutan rehabilitation center in Borneo where uh, animals are kind of released to the wild, but the people put out fruit every day for kind of all animals that are kind of learning to kind of find the food in the forest. So providing extra food can support a higher population of these orangutans as they return to the forest. Um, OK, so we can relocate animals. Uh, to maintain, I'm going to zoom in, to maintain uh, genetic biodiversity. So um, I watched a program a few years back about catching giraffes and like relocating them hundreds of kilometers away in different parts of Africa because there was low biodiversity in one reserve. So they had to catch these giraffes, which was really difficult, put them in a van, tranquilize them, carry them very carefully to a different reserve to try and maintain the genetic biodiversity. So that could be something they're doing. Um, we also have talked in previous videos about um, having wildlife corridors. So relate, relocating animals to maintain genetic biodiversity. Um, wildlife corridors to allow organisms from different reserves to, to kind of um, breed. Um, sort of anti-poaching patrols. That's obviously an active strategy, um, but with a big impact, you know, stopping poachers from killing um, 
uh, elephants, for example, vaccination. So this was news to me when I found out last year that koalas in Australia are dying of chlamydia. Yeah, chlamydia. It's, an, it's a sexually transmitted disease for both humans and koalas. Um, and vaccinating koalas against chlamydia can have a massive impact on um, the population size. So that's something we're doing. Um, and then there's also kind of actually modifying the habitat through things like coppicing. Okay, so I'm going to put that in blue. Now, coppicing came up as a six marker a few years ago. Um, it could come up again. Probably not this year, but it, it could do. So coppicing, here's a picture of a tree, a coppiced tree. Um, and you can basically see that this, um, the tree, I'll just do a very bad diagram. Here's a tree, here's a normal tree, okay? Leaves on the tree. And what you do is you cut the tree down to the stump, okay? There it is. And then after a while, the stump sprouts lots of new uh, kind of branches. And the branches are thinner. Uh, and kind of bushier, like this. But what happens, actually, in a coppiced woodland is two things. First of all, uh, let's go to red, um, these stems are sustainable timber, okay? Because you, you can keep doing this. You can go round, oh, not to there again. Sorry, let's just rub that out. You can basically re-coppice. You can cut these stems off and go back to there, and the tree will regenerate. So sustainable timber. Not like timber for like building buildings, like massive big blocks of timber, but more timber for kind of um, wooden baskets and wooden chairs and stuff like that. Kind of thin pieces of coppiced wood that can be quite useful for kind of small scale manufacture. Um, the other thing is that actually in coppiced woodlands, you tend to have more light gets to the forest floor so um, sometimes you actually have lower biodiversity in a mature woodland. And actually, I recently was lucky enough to go to a biological field trip at the Field Studies Council down in, where was it? Down in Juniper Hall near Box Hill. And we did a little investigation and we went to mature woodland, far lower biodiversity than in coppiced woodland, because um, in the coppiced woodland, the main thing was that more light gets to the forest floor, which supports a greater biodiversity of species, little kind of plant species in the forest. Um, so more plants on the, on the ground. OK, so that's coppicing. So it's an ancient practice, basically cutting down trees. Uh, for sustainable timber. There are sort of other varieties of coppicing, like if you chop the tree right at the bottom, it's called coppicing. Um, and if you sort of, um, high, if you chop higher up, it's called pollarding, but it's basically the same deal. But pollarding is less, um, less affected by deer, because if deer, if there's lots of deer and you're coppicing, the deer basically eat the shoots before they can get high enough. So pollarding puts it above the deer's Kind of mouth level, I guess, so that, that kind of helps. Now it's worth noting that sometimes conservation strategies go wrong. Uh, a really classic example is um, in Australia, I forget exactly what year, but I think it was like in the 60s or 70s, there was a big problem with this introduced, with an insect that wasn't supposed to be there, it was an invasive species, and it was called the cane fly. And it was um, eating a lot of the crops that the government was trying to grow, cane sugar. So um, someone, who maybe didn't do their research was like, oh, well, we need something to eat the cane fly. Oh, there's this type of thing called the cane toad, which is from South America, maybe, or Hawaii. I can't remember where it's from. So the cane toad will eat the cane fly. Of course it will. So let's introduce the cane toad. So they introduced the cane toad. Did the cane toad eat the cane fly? No, it didn't. It ate everything else. It eats, like, it is a plague in Australia. Um, it's, to it's poisonous. So, like, if an other animals try and eat it, they die. Um, it's really invasive, it's really predatory, it eats all the, um, the young of lots of endangered marsupials, um, and it's really hard to eradicate. So the cane toad uh, is a classic, very bad conservation strategy gone wrong. So, you know, if you are going to do one of these strategies, we need to make sure that it is the right strategy and it needs to be properly researched and evaluated 
before um, we kind of try something that has a negative impact. Okay, so that coppicing is, an ex is, is actually an example of sustainable management, but we would call it small-scale uh, timber, okay? Small-scale timber management. is this kind of coppicing strategy. We can also have larger scale management. So larger scale timber management uh, involves a few different strategies. We could have um, clear felling and replanting. So this can be quite like, um, if you don't know what's going on, this can look really bad because like near where my parents live, they live in the countryside in the UK, um, there's some forests and I only always go walking around there uh, when I'm down visiting them. And one day I went going to this forest, which I always go to and it wasn't there, like the whole forest was gone. Uh, and I thought this was awful. Uh, the forestry commission had gone in and like cut all the trees down to the base, they were just gone. Um, but it turns out they do this every 20 or 30 years, I just didn't know, um, on a cycle. So they choose which bits of forest to clear cut, they take all the wood out and they just leave the tiny little saplings. But then 20 or 30 years later, those saplings have matured to be full trees again. Sometimes there needs to be a little bit of um, management in the, in the middle stages, but the idea is that you cut down a forest and either you allow the saplings to regrow or you actually go in and replant. So clear felling and replanting um, on a cycle. Um, and that's sustainable because the trees will grow back. So that's one thing. Now actually this clear felling is not done as frequently as it used to be because when you have the forest completely felled in an area, it means the soil um, is sort of exposed. So I'll put a sort of negative next to this soil is at risk. Okay, so this is only done in certain spots where there's enough maybe undergrowth to kind of shelter the soil or maybe this, the forest isn't on a big slope so the soil's not at risk, but they do still do this in some, at some times. Um, other things that we can do is selective felling. So this is going in and extract sorry, excuse me, extracting only the logs that, that are wanted. So this can be tricky. Um, so how to, to get only one tree, how to get it out. Um, it can be done. And there is even some examples of this being done in like rainforest to get high value timber out. So things like um, tropical hardwoods like mahogany, they cost a lot of money. Um, they're pretty much protected trees. Um, and it's like really sort of rich, dark reddish wood, um, which is like highly prized in furniture and stuff. Um, but there, there is one um, example of a forest that has been harvested like this in Indonesia for 30 years, um, where they just go in and they take the one tree and they'll take like a tree every month from a huge area, but that's only really doable because the trees are so valuable. Um, and it's very difficult to minimize damage whilst taking out that tree because if you've got tractors and stuff or diggers going in to get the tree you're damaging it um, so yeah there's there's I don't know there's a lot of debate about whether this you know how this can be done well I know even in Thailand and stuff like that sometimes they even use elephants to do this but there's a huge debate about whether elephants should be used uh, in this way because it's like not very nice for the elephants um, even though it does have a lower impact on the forest. Okay, so that's something you could look into if you wanted to. Okay, so that's large scale uh, timber kind of management. And there's probably loads of other strategies that we haven't really covered that might involve sort of different elements of this. So for example, like leaving some trees as kind of um, standards, that, that means there's like one big tree that kind of grows up and kind of provides a bit of shelter and then having other trees underneath that are either coppiced or selectively removed. So that, you know, there's lots of different strategies that we can use to manage timber sustainably, depending on the demands of, of the place that we're kind of managing. So the other big thing in kind of sustainable management is fisheries, okay? So I'm just gonna draw a fish. That's not a very good fish, but yeah, there's my fish, okay? scales. Fisheries. 
So we talked about unsustainable fisheries down here. So how can we manage things um, sustainable? Remember, sustainability is about ensuring that the what is there now remains for the future. The golden rule is don't take more than um, than than is produced okay through breeding so you can only take the amount of fish that the population growth rate can can kind of replenish and if, if you don't if you go beyond that then it's unsustainable so there's various different strategies that we can use uh, we can have seasonal seasonal regulations so that there's like a few months off every year to allow fish to reproduce and kind of um, restock the population. There can be um, mesh size limits. <clears throat> okay, so mesh size limits, that's another thing that the government can do. That's like, so basically the mesh is like the size of the, the netting, basically. With very fine mesh, it'll catch all the fish. But if you have a larger mesh, then maybe the baby fish can escape the net and live to kind of breed and kind of replenish the population. So mesh size is another thing. You can have uh, no catch zones around uh, around different parts of the sea where fishermen aren't allowed to go, which means that the fish can kind of breed in those areas um, and so on. But there's lots of different strategies you can use. Um, finally, another thing that you can do is aquaculture. So aquaculture is something that I think is possible that could come up. So aquaculture is fish farming. Um, and it's it's kind of in the textbook, but kind of briefly. Um, and it's this like basically the idea of farming fish. Okay, so you know basically you have small fish might be hatched on, you know in big tanks from eggs and sperm, you know, like almost like in a in big tank, tiny little fish like this big. And then once they get to a certain size, you put them in a big um, net out at sea or in a lake, uh, and you allow them to grow as you feed them food. So you're farming them, they're, they're in captivity, they're already in the nets, but you just supply them everything they need, and then you harvest them when they're big enough. So this is a real big growth industry. It's predicted that, in, especially in the developing world, um, the amount of fish produced via aquaculture is going to be bigger than the amount of fish produced by catching wild fish sort of now-ish or in the near future. Um, there are problems associated with aquaculture sometimes, such as if you have very high densities, um, you can cause disease or there can be diseases within, within the kind of um, populations at high density in, in cages. Um, but generally speaking, if we want to get more fish sustainably, it is a strategy that, that has merit. Okay, so aquaculture, fish farming, small fish hatched, raised in uh, cages. Uh, and we'll just put a little, you know, negative pollution, disease, positive, increased yield. Okay. Um, doesn't doesn't reduce wild populations and then it's sustainable because you know every time you catch fish you are replenishing with with small fish okay so it is by its very nature kind of sustainable you replace what you harvest and so on it's farming okay um, I'll just very quickly show you uh, the screen grab <clears throat> of that previous video I'll just very quickly here show you this screen grab from that other video this six mark question which I kind of um, created to kind of assess this so if you want to go a bit more detail there are some kind of things that you can do to increase sustainable yield of fish okay right let's back go back to the mind map okay we've covered a lot of the um the background of population sustainability more i should say the theory and now we're going to look at some case studies where we can kind of start to put this into practice so the first two case studies that we're going to look at sorry first three are the terai in nepal the maasai um, and peat bogs, and these concert, these case studies are kind of about balancing human needs with conservation needs, and often these can come into conflict. So first of all, the terai. Now this is in Nepal. Uh, what color should we do? Let's do green. Okay, so this is Nepal.
and it's the kind of the flat land of Nepal, not the mountains. Uh, and it is a kind of a mosaic of forest and marsh and savanna. And that's because there's a lot of um, kind of rivers that run through this area, uh, sort of down from the Himalayas. Um, and it is home to things like tigers and rhinoceroses. Something called the one-horned rhinoceros. Here's a picture. <clears throat> and I've actually visited this area. Um, and this area is under pressure because there's a conflict between agriculture and kind of conservation. So the forest is a rich resource where the tigers, the rhinoceroses, and, and the biodiversity kind of really exists. But people, there's a conflict because people um, want to fell the forest for a few reasons. So let's kind of put this conflict in here. Um, conflict. It's, it's agriculture. Uh, it's increasing human population. Uh, and it's also firewood as well. So all these things are kind of putting pressure on the forest. And then maybe let's go to blue for the kind of resolution. So there's a couple of things. First of all, wildlife reserves. Protect some areas um, pretty much exclusively. So there are places like the Chitwan National Park. Um, and I visited there, you know, I paid money to stay in a hotel there. I paid money to guides to like guide me around to try and see as much wildlife as possible and take photos and to kind of, you know, soak it all up. So that obviously creates jobs. So there are jobs to be, uh, lots of jobs, jobs in tourism in those reserves. And those reserves act as kind of havens for certain wildlife. But around those reserves, the local government, in collaboration with the WWF, which is the World Wildlife Fund, set up something quite interesting. They set up these um, community forestry initiatives. OK, so in these communi community forestry initiatives, people were given um, rights to extract materials, but also responsibilities to look after these areas. So there's kind of a mixed use, not um, full protection, kind of mixed use. And local people could take firewood and some resources, but local people also could get benefits if they maintained the biodiversity of these areas because people could come and kind of do ecotourism in these areas, um, uh, which was which is kind of get, gives them a lot of money. And they were also, I think, maybe paid by the government to kind of um, preserve their areas. Now, this kind of created like a network of some national parks some community parks and some areas of agriculture and this kind of meshwork of national parks and then sort of semi-national parks allows movement of animals from one national park to the next thereby conserving the biodiversity of the terra region as a whole and this has been um, very successful okay oh other things as well other things that were sort of key um, is um, biogas stoves so there's like you know, small scale agriculture in Nepal. So people have animals like goats and cattle and things like that. And if you basically take the poo and shovel it underground into like a, a tank and let it ferment, it produces gas, which can then be burnt for cooking. This replaces firewood um, and therefore is, is a great means of conservation. It really reduces the extraction of firewood from forests. So biogas stoves or even just more efficient stoves, you know, if you can make a stove better at burning wood, then you need to cut down less wood. So this is, you know, a small change that can have a big impact in an area. So that's the terai. Um, <clears throat> now the Masai Mara is a very famous area of Kenya. It's really, really famous for these large herbivore migrations. So the rainy season kind of moves north and south in the Masai, uh, the, sorry, in the Masai Mara area over the year. It's a huge, huge area in Kenya and also Tanzania. And basically the, the animals follow the rain. The wildebeest, which are kind of like cows, follow the rain. So they move north when it rains up there and they move south when it rains down there. Uh, and people pay a lot of money to go and see this migration. So let's write some of that down. Uh, so, okay, Masai, um, wildebeest, migration, 
Uh, so Kenya, Tanzania. I guess also we should talk about the uh, Maasai, um, uh, Maasai tribe, or the traditional um, kind of landholders. The, the, you know, they've been living there, raising animals there in the Maasai Mara kind of um, plains for hundreds of thousands of years. So um, there's a conflict between their continuing use of the land and kind of conservation. Um, and what else can we put? We can put, um, you know, like, I don't know, uh, biodiverse, lions, etc. Okay, giraffes, you know, all the big African mammals that you may expect to find, they're all there. Okay, the problem is, problem, the conflict in red, conflict is mainly to do with agriculture, okay? And cattle grazing, really. And also uh, wheat fields. So cattle grazing is one thing, because you can kind of have cattle grazing on land for parts of the year and then move them off for other parts of the year when the wildebeest are there. But converting some of the land to wheat fields is more, um, has more of a negative impact on the biodiversity. So the National Parks in the Maasai uh, NP was created in uh, 1945. <clears throat> so anyway, the National Park was created in 1945, but from, from sort of 45, um, you know, up to, you know, really the early 2000s, the area for free roaming wildebeest shrunk. So um, let's say the pristine uh, area shrunk, and this is kind of complicated and political and almost sociological, but it was all to do with the kind of the land rights that people were given. So because of the land rights that people were given, people felt under threat if they didn't convert their little um, patch of land into fields, basically. Um, so there was kind of a perverse incentive that made them sort of fence off bits of land and say, okay, this is my land, and I'm going to use it for agriculture. So the pristine area shrunk a great deal um, over, over, the, over, the, over the years. And actually, you know, 40,000 acres, which is a lot, uh, went to wheat, converted to wheat. So that was, that's all kind of a problem. Maybe I should have done that in red, actually. Uh, sort of weird land use incentives. Uh, and what they did is in the early 2000s, they changed this um, and they in introduced a new thing called payment for wildlife conservancy. Sorry, payment for wildlife conservation. And these, uh, with this payment, there was the setup of these new conservancies, where again there was mixed use allowed. So it's similar to the Rai. So in these mixed use conservancies, grazing was allowed for parts of the year. Cattle was moved on to the land for grazing, but then the cattle was moved off the land when the wildebeest migration was coming in. So this is not perfect. It does maintain the land for the wildebeest migration, keeps biodiversity, but when the cattle has moved off the land, it has a negative impact because they will have to go somewhere um, and it becomes quite sort of high density population of cattle, which can affect the neighbouring areas around the conservancy. But it's a good model for this kind of mixed use um, management where people are allowed um, to get benefit from that, you know, allowed to kind of use the land for their own uses or for agriculture, but they also are incentivized to conserve. Okay, so this is another kind of general principle. Finally, peat. Uh, this is UK. Uh, and basically, peat is like mossy ground. Um, but this mossy ground, it's actually called sphagnum moss. 
is very slow growing. It builds up over generations uh, or thousands of years. And actually it locks in carbon, um, but it's really mossy and it um, soaks up moisture. Uh, and as a consequence, there's high, bio high biodiversity there. Now, basically the problem is this really mossy, high moisture ground uh, in the past was great for, for compost. Do I mean compost? Yeah, compost for the soil. Um, so people used to basically take peat um, and use it for compost or soil in gardens. You used to be able to buy in garden centers like genuine peat compost, which had been harvested from places in the UK. Um, so the peatlands were being kind of degraded, just basically used for people's gardens. Um, but now this has basically been, bla uh, been banned. <clears throat> so the, the, the peat got down to only one tenth of its original um, extent, which is you know pretty bad to be honest, but basically now peat harvesting is no longer allowed. So I guess this is less of a kind of coming to a middle ground between human use and conservation use, and more of a, just a recognition that things have gone too far, that we need to protect this. Um, so there is now this UK Biodiversity Action Plan, uh, which aims to slowly restore uh, peatlands. So we can also put UK Biodiversity Action Plan, UK BDAP, uh, aims to restore peat. One of the ways they do this um, is they kind of um, they actually fly over the old peatlands in a helicopter, dropping tiny little pellets of sphagnum moss, little grains like this, uh, with the aim that they'll kind of take root and grow and, and restore the peatlands. That's kind of interesting. Okay, now we're going to look at some other case studies um, of four other places where there is a specific vulnerability. So I wanted to actually show you the syllabus statement for this, uh, and actually it's for this whole thing. I meant to show it to you before, but people often say, do I need to know like all the details of all of these case studies? Um, and it's really difficult to say, I don't think so. I don't think you will ever be, uh, you never get like a gap fill, which ex expects you to kind of complete what species there are in Masai Mara. Um, but what you do need to understand is strategies for the management of environmental resources and the effects of human activities, okay? So this is the syllabus. It says to include how ecosystems can be managed to balance the conflict between conservation and preservation and human needs. So we've kind of looked at those first three. That's what we've done. And now we're moving on to kind of look at um, in these specific environmentally sensitive ecosystems. So like what extra strategies do we need to use if places are of real kind of ecological significance okay and again i don't think it's about knowing all the facts it's about being able to kind of have a good understanding of all the facts but then to pull out from those facts broader strategies that you could apply to a new scenario because that's i think what could come up okay so i'm going to get rid of that statement now and we'll get into the galapagos okay <clears throat> so the Galapagos Islands, um, here's a little map of where they are. Uh, they are a wonderful, wonderful place to visit if you ever get the opportunity. I really, really highly recommend it. And the reason they're such a wonderful place is because they have a high amount of endemic species. Because they're situated, I think, like about 600 miles off the coast of South America, basically in evolutionary terms, organisms or animals and plants kind of drifted across from South America quite rarely. And when they landed on the islands, they began to turn into new species. So all the most of the species that are on the Galapagos are either very distinct and are kind of just found there, or because there was very little human settlement there for many, many years, they're kind of like very easily approachable. Uh, they don't kind of fear humans very much because uh, humans haven't been there for very long. So it's a great place to do wildlife watching. Um, so uh, let's... A little couple of facts about them. So they, they are part of Ecuador. They are part of the country of Ecuador. They're about 600, um, is it miles or kilometers? I can't remember, but 600 miles 
off South America. Uh, they have a high amount of endemic species, um, and such as you know the Galapagos finches uh, and tortoises and different types of plant. And they were where Charles Darwin kind of came up with his ideas, or where he where he first his ideas about evolution were kind of sparked he kind of developed his theories later using his notes from his time in the Galapagos so they have their specific significance sort of for biologists okay so let's look at threats and then kind of management strategies <clears throat> okay so I guess we should probably just maybe do like a table on this one so threats and then we can have a kind of more specific management for each threat Okay, so I, th I think the, the biggest, well, big threat was overexploitation. I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so big threat was overexploitation. Uh, and this is mainly like historically. So, for example, uh, when whaling was a big deal, like in the 1800s, um, whaling boats killed 200,000 tortoises. My goodness. So, 200,000 tortoises were killed in a short period of time. And whalers basically used to change their routes so they would stop off at the Galapagos to like feast on tortoises because tortoises were massive, apparently quite nice to eat. Um, and they didn't really run away because they're tortoises, they're really slow. So there was such easy prey and whalers who hadn't had fresh meat for ages used to just like land on the Galapagos, eat some tortoises and then move on again. 200,000 tortoises were killed over 50 years. So a big deal. So overexploitation of tortoises, obviously this has now stopped, you know, um, so laws, okay, there are laws in place now that means we can't do this, uh, all these animals are protected. Uh, there is also um, problems with land use, so habitat disturbance. Now a lot of the um, Galapagos is national park, okay, so um, national park, no development permitted. However, there is a growing population. Uh, the Galapagos population, so the Galapagos population has grown from around about, well, 2,000 people. And this is, I'm not sure if this data is, well. And the Galapagos population has grown from about 2,000 people in 1960 uh, to certainly over 30,000 people today, um, or probably more, I couldn't find uh, this year's figure. So that one of the reasons is because there's a lot of jobs in the Galapagos. It's a huge destination for, for, for ecotourism, uh, so there's a lot of jobs there. Uh, and in Ecuador, maybe there aren't as many jobs in the mainland Ecuador. So people want to move, Ecuadorians, from mainland Ecuador to the Galapagos, but there are tight controls on how you can move there. When I visited, um, I think they've really put a clamp down on this. And one of one of the guides who I was talking to was saying that in order to go to the Galapagos, you basically need to marry someone who was born on the Galapagos um, to kind of like get a permit to, to stay there. OK, um, so this is kind of one thing that uh, is being done. National Park, no development permitted, um, difficult to difficult to move there. Okay, what else? We've got um, <clears throat> introduced species. This is a huge thing, okay? So, um, goats. Goats eat, goats shouldn't be there. Goats were introduced, I don't know, 100 years ago by sailors. They eat the vegetation, they destroy the habitat, and they outcompete tortoises, for example. Pigs. Okay, pigs, they eat tortoise eggs. So a strategy to eliminate these two has actually been culling. Uh, they fly over the island shooting goats and pigs out of helicopters, which I'm actually okay with. I know it sounds drastic, but there's plenty of places that goats and pigs can be. They don't need to be on the Galapagos, uh, and they've had great success with this. 
it can be more difficult if the thing that you're trying to eradicate is smaller. There's a fly, uh, I can't remember exactly what type of fly, that basically um, lays maggots, which is gross, I hate maggots, um, in, bird, in like baby birds. And the, the maggots basically like eat the baby birds. And this is a big problem for finches. So that can be an issue or, and other insects. OK, insects can be a big issue. They have had some success in using ladybirds. So that's a natural pest uh, control to kind of eradicate some of those insects. But it is quite difficult. Um, another thing with over exploitation, I forgot to add, um, is like shark finning which is like the worst thing in the world ever. I hate it. Um, and there are lots of sh um, fishing boats that basically camp around the Galapagos and try and catch any sharks that leave the protected waters of the Galapagos. But recently I did see some good news that the, I think the area that was protected was expanded. The marine area was expanded to kind of prevent or stop a bit of this practice. But 150,000 sharks each year each year are killed around the Galapagos, which is awful. Um, other introduced species, we've got like um, plants, okay, plants are um, massive, okay, so seeds spread by tourists often, okay, so you don't have to bring a seed intentionally to the Galapagos, it could be on your boot, okay, so now when you go to the Galapagos, when I went to the Galapagos, tourists are scanned, okay, they, your bags are checked, fully you can't have any fruit when you land in the Galapagos because if you throw a pip out then you've got a new species on the Galapagos so tourists are checked and even the soles of your shoes are checked for you know if there's any mud if you visited a farm on the mainland and you've stepped in some mud with had some seeds in it then when you walk around in the Galapagos those seeds could fall off so there's very thorough thorough checks so those are some of the things that are done there's laws there's um, national park, uh, you know, um, throughout most, most of the island. Development is very strictly controlled, difficult to move there. There's culling of introduced species. There's um, targeted elimination of species. Tourists are checked to try and reduce any um, new introduced species. There is a bit of a conflict sometimes between people who live on the Galapagos and the kind of government and the laws. For example, I remember my guide saying that uh, I don't think you could get, you couldn't have a cat as a pet anymore, I don't think. I think the government were trying to ban it because cats were eating the native finches and this was causing a bit of a, you know, like discord or something between, between the Galapagenos, the people who live in the Galapagos, um, and the government. Okay. Okay, moving on to the Antarctic. Okay, so the Antarctic kind of, uh, I guess it almost used to be like considered, like almost you didn't have to, bother preserving it because it was so difficult to get to but it is possible to get to Antarctica um, and it is now not the territory of one country but is kind of divided up and kind of managed by several countries here's, here's a little map of how that works okay so there are many treaties the Antarctic Treaty being the main one that govern the kind of government and protection of Antarctica um, uh, to protect the mainly the marine life uh, and, and the kind of seabird life and stuff that live there, because there's not a lot like right in the central continent of Antarctica. There's not a lot of, um, of life there. Uh, so we're mainly talking about the coast. OK, well, let's talk about the coast. Right, what things have we got? Well, um, we've got sea life. Um, so the, the it's kind of basis of the pyramid of biomass there is krill. Krill is a little tiny shrimp like thing. And it didn't really used to be um, on the menu for humans. It didn't really used to be fished for. But now it is, but mainly because it can be used to feed um, other organisms. So, for example, it can be used to make nutritional supplements. I think like it's probably found in like omega-3 type tablets and stuff like that. Uh, and for animal feed or, or fish feed for fish farms. So the problem is that now that we can harvest krill very effectively, we can kind of take out the basis of the food chain and affect all the other species above it, like penguins and, and even whales and stuff like that. So the problem is we're basically too good at it. We're too good at fishing. Krill. So the idea is that these big swarms of krill, they move around the continent of Antarctica at different times of the year. Um, but we using kind of sophisticated, I don't know, satellites and technology, whatever we do, we can kind of follow those 
big schools, shoals of krill, and catch them really effectively. But we, we're so good at it that we can outcompete the other organisms in Antarctica. Okay, so actually now that we have we have sort of laws and guidelines, regulations, let's say, that stop this. So instead of what we would do if there were no laws, we'd basically just focus all our efforts on one area where the krill were in their highest abundance. These regulations say actually you have to kind of fish across a much wider area the same amount. So that gives the um, other animals more of a chance to, to harvest some of that krill kind of bounty. Um, stop this kind of, let's say, concentrated fishing. Uh, okay, that's krill. What else? Let's go down here. We've also got whales. Uh, whales. Um, now, whales kind of breed in the Antarctic waters in the summer, so there's now a Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. Uh, So it's illegal to hunt and kill whales in this in this sanctuary, so it's basically like a, a large marine protected zone. We've also got um, bird life uh, on Antarctica and on some of the kind of islands off the coast. <clears throat> uh, and this is things like albatrosses, albatross and petrels. And these are seabirds that feed off of um, kind of squid and stuff like that in the sea. And the major threat to them, the red here, is long line fishing. So long line fishing is where you basically have a really long line, like 20 kilometers or something, off the back of a fishing boat that has multiple hooks all the way down the line. And each of these hooks has a little piece of bait on it. Now, these albatrosses that are flying overhead, they might not even see the boat, but they see something down in the water. They swoop down, they try and grab it, and they get attached to the fishing line. So this is the major threat to their existence. Um, and the kind of solution is uh, basically modifying the line so that it sinks, so we could have um, kind of weights on it, so that it sinks down so the birds can't reach it, or bird scarers attached to the line, which kind of do what you might expect. They scare away the birds so they don't attach the line. And these can be quite effective. Uh, the textbook I'm looking at here says that one Chilean fishery has reduced its kind of bird catch to zero by using some of these methods. Okay, so that's Antarctica. Okay, we are on to our last two, which I've kind of lumped together in my mind map, but perhaps that wasn't a good idea. These are both in the UK, but they are distinct places. So Snowdonia is in Wales, um, and the Lake District is kind of in the north of England. Uh, if you are sitting in the Lake District right now, you know where it is, but I'm in London. Uh, so for the Londoners amongst us, it's kind of um, up to the north west of the UK, near the border of Scotland, okay? All right, so <clears throat> let's look at those two areas. Okay, first of all, Snowdonia. Let's look at this one. Okay, so Snowdonia, uh, mountainous. It's a tourist destination, okay? Mount Snowdon is a tourist destination. People climb it, thousands of people climb it every year. It contains a patchwork of habitats. There's moorland, um, there's wetland, there's forests, etc. Okay, so what are the problems? Well, there's a couple of problems. Um, tourism is a problem, okay? Um, it creates potentially trampling, it creates rubbish, uh, not everyone who climbs in these areas is a good tourist. Uh, some people leave rubbish uh, and so on. So problem, well, fixes, we kind of have paths are maintained to encourage people to only walk on the paths and not trample over delicate grassland. We have gutters down the sides of the path that allow for because water basically lands on the path and runs off really quickly, which can cause erosion. But we have gutters that kind of minimize this. And the gutters are regularly cleaned in case people drop their packets of crisps or whatever. Awful. 
uh, into the gutters, you know, people will come and clean that periodically. So gutters are maintained. <clears throat> um, there's also a bit of a conflict between agriculture. Uh, so farmers often seek to dry out the land by digging drainage ditches and stuff like that. But we can kind of um, do things to kind of slow water flow to maintain the moisture in the land. So, for example, they can put hay bales and drainage ditches or block drainage ditches with kind of logs that allows water to trickle out, but more slowly to maintain the moisture in the land. Um, other problems are with, um, so sometimes people, in the past, when you know forest has been cut down, the government said, oh, here's cash to build forests. Okay, if you put a forest back, we're gonna use the money. But actually this was a bad incentive because people planted lots of fast growing conifers, like Christmas trees, and those are not very biodiverse. So there are now there's now a shifting um, of incentives to kind of encourage more diverse planting, basically. Um, and then we've also got um, controlled burning can reduce the impact of large fires. So if you burn frequently and often small fires, it reduces the chance of really big um, dangerous fires that, that happen. Okay, so that's Snowdonia. Uh, and now we look at the Lake District. So the Lake District is uh, a national park, as is Snowdonia, I think so. Uh, so Lake District National Park. And I think what's interesting about the Lake District is, in a sense, it's not a natural ecosystem, okay? Stay with me here. It's beautiful. It's lovely. But if if no human impact, if there was no humans in the lake district, it wouldn't look like it is now. So it is a place where there is deflected succession, which means that you know, without some grazing and some kind of yeah, without grazing, basically, it would be a forest. So the preservation of the lake district is really about preserving agricultural methods from like 100 or 200 years ago. If we allowed modern, like fully modern, like industrial farming to happen there, it wouldn't look like it is now. So a lot of the incentives that the government have put in place are about preserving older methods of farming that allowed for more biodiverse ecosystem, okay? Um, modern methods of farming are more monoculture, more pesticides, all that kind of stuff. Older methods of farming 200 years ago created much more biodiverse kind of patchworks of farmland and hedges and stuff like that. So um, let's look at some problems. Okay, so we've got conifers. Same, okay, same as that. Um, we've got invasive species. And I bet as I'm sort of listing these, now that we've done a few of these case studies, you can probably think of ways to tackle them. We've got um, meadows decreasing. So a meadow was some place where farmers basically used to just let wild grasses grow, I mean, they grow throughout the year, and then they chop it down at the end of the year to, to make hay for winter feed. That doesn't happen as much anymore in sort of industrial farming, so meadows are being lost. Um, heathland is disappearing, this is kind of shrubland. Myers and trampling. The solution for trampling is much the same as on the other side. So we've got paths, etc. Conifers. Um, so we have more broad, broad leaf forests with oak and beech and stuff like that. Incentivized, the government's made oops more incentives for that. Um, invasive species, they can be removed. Meadows decreasing, farmer payments, um, so that farmers do have meadows. Heathland, this is like where you've got areas of land with little bushes and shrubs and stuff like that. So again, controlled burning, so that it doesn't have a big fire, 
but there are control fires to kind of maintain the ecosystem. And Myers is wetlands. And again, like before, some farmers have been seeking to kind of dry out the land. But again, we can create incentives and, and grants and money to maintain the wetlands, often with even artificial dams and stuff like that to maintain water levels. So that's the end of the mind map on population sustainability. Just to recap, we first of all looked at factors that affected population size. Then we looked at how different populations can interact, intraspecific and interspecific competition. We looked at the reasons for conservation briefly, and then we kind of looked at this idea of a sliding scale between preservation to conservation, sustainable management and exploitation. Then we looked at some case studies, um, and I guess each case study we could kind of put it on a scale um, from preservation to exploitation. And remember that when we're looking at case studies, it's not about knowing everything, it's about drawing out general principles which you can apply two different uh, scenarios. Okay, so that's the end of the mind map. Best of luck if you'll sit an exam this week, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.